So, uh, like you said, we're going to talk about the current state of fishing and basically uh, same old tactics but uh, new tricks in the bag. So, moving on. Uh, I meant to take Meme Board out, but it seems like that stayed. Uh, so, I graduated from University of Tennessee at Chattanooga a little over two years ago. Uh, previously worked at Protivity, and I did a lot of compliance work, uh, PCI, HIPAA, and I also worked in a SOC for several months, so got some awesome experience. I'm currently a uh, penetration tester of Rapid 7, working out of our Austin, Texas office, and I enjoy breaking things. Hey guys, I'm uh, David Toulis, uh, senior penetration tester at Protivity. Been working there for about two and a half years out of the Philadelphia office. Uh, I also graduated from uh, University of Tennessee Chattanooga. Anyone else you teach at here? No? Alright. Uh, yeah. uh, you can follow me on all the social media platforms. I like to retweet stuff. Uh, I got a blog and some code on GitHub. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Oh, can I get this one? Yeah. Alright, sorry. So, um, this talk is kind of geared towards penetration testers. Uh, I'm not a blue teamer, he's not a blue teamer. We don't know a whole lot about the defense. Uh, but we just kind of want to talk about some steps that you can take in your fishing campaign to increase the effectiveness of the campaign. And obviously none of these tactics are going to be working 100% of the time. It's going to be different on every network. It's going to be different on the technologies on the network. Uh, but these are techniques that have worked for both of us in the past uh, with a lot of success. Uh, so the game has kind of been changing uh, lately, and I think it's changing in favor of the blue team. Uh, Yeah, so as the you know, team increases the layers of defense, uh, we as penetration testers have to practice uh, offense in depth. So, uh, you know, each stage of the fishing campaign, uh, you know, there are, there are detective measures in place, there are measures that will block the payload in place, and you as a penetration tester have to bypass each one of those for a successful campaign, often not knowing even what, what technologies are in place. You've got to, you know, tailor your campaign for the network you're targeting. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really just an endless game of cat and mouse, uh, you know, especially with you know cloud mail providers like Microsoft Office 365, G Suite Mail, uh, sharing threat intelligence between certain industries, uh, you know, mail attachment sandboxing, static and dynamic analysis of attached to Office macros, uh, browser protections, uh, cloud antivirus solutions, that sort of thing uh, is really shifting in my opinion, in favor of the blue team. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you follow these two guys on Twitter, but they're tweeting out uh, fishing campaigns every day. Uh, I've had my fishing campaign tweeted out by these guys before, uh, which I think is really cool because smaller organizations, which may not have the resources for a you know, full blue team or a full hunt team, are getting these protections without even knowing it. Like, I can send a, I can send a fishing campaign at 10 a.m., and it, by noon, it's already on Twitter, and the, the client didn't even know, uh, you know that they had this protection with Office 365. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, they, they put a lot of protections in place. This is kind of generic uh, Microsoft ATP, uh, how it works. Like, Matt, evil goes in, good stuff comes out. Uh, but they are doing a very good job, in my opinion. Uh, <coughs> So, kind of to start us off about uh, the beginning of every good fishing campaign, uh, we're not going to talk in depth about OSINT, uh, building pretexts, but we did want to touch on it because it's obviously a huge part of a fishing campaign. So, here you see, um, we, we just did some basic stuff. The, the far right slide, we're using something that we call Google Dorks. So, basically, uh, you can do semi-advanced filtering for uh, websites, subdomains, and you can see there, all I've done is I'm searching for AtlanticGA.gov and I'm filtering out all the WWWs, so maybe find some interesting subdomains. Uh, this is part of when you're building what you're looking for in terms of a pretext, maybe cloning a, an a centrally authenticating portal. Uh, some other very useful things for subdomain enumeration, uh, Hacker Target uh, has a search function and also a very useful API as you can see, as well as uh, Virus Total for the past few years has some awesome subdomain enumeration. So, uh, Another reason I put this is not just for your OSINT or your 
Um, subdomain enumeration whenever you're starting a campaign, but it's also about evaluating the maturity of who your target is. Uh, David just got done talking about offense in depth, but something that you can tell very quickly about an organization when I'm starting an assessment, I can visit some of the some of some of the subdomains that stand out the most to me, like Citrix or OA, and if they have multi-factor authentication uh, implemented, then that tells me something about their maturity. Just to make uh, general assumptions when you're starting your campaign. So the first thing we're going to talk about is domain categorization. And just to give a brief summary of what that is, uh, it's a third-party solution that is going to filter resolution of domain names based on a pre-assigned category or in association with a pre-assigned category that you don't want your users viewing. Uh, so it, it basically it's like whitelist, blacklist type thing. If a domain has been visited and has a reputation of being for news, then it's categorized as business or news. And if you want to allow your users to visit business websites, then you can let them do that through domain categorization and filter out potentially unwanted domains. Uh, but the next thing I want to note is with preparation, uh, categorization for your phishing domain can easily be obtained prior to the assessment. Um, for categorization, a lot of third-party solutions tell uh, buyers, big companies, that this is a manual process. Somehow we have tons of employees that are sifting through all of these sites to verify that they're okay for your users. That's 100% not the case. It's a lot of third-party solutions do this in an automated fashion. They're filtering for keywords. So I can clone a website, throw it up, submit it to the 10 popular uh, domain categorization solutions, and then get it categorized as finance or medical. And also, we'll touch on in a second, specific solutions can often be determined prior to the assessment as well. Uh, here's just a list of some resources that you can use to check categorization of maybe a domain that you're currently using for phishing or something like that. But a lot of the third-party solutions have these online resources where I can just go check IBM Exports right now what my efficient domain's categorized it as, or with Bluco, or any of those. Uh, or you can get it categorized yourself. Like I mentioned, you can just submit a categorization request like uh, normal people do with their sites that want to make it through these filters. So uh, you can do a simple recursive wget, clone somebody else's site, Obviously, remember to take out all the copyrighted material or anything that's going to get you in trouble. That's the tedious part. Uh, or you can just build your own template. That's probably the safest way to avoid legal issues. And if it has the right keywords and it's kind of pretty, it's probably going to get categorized and then it'll make it through domain categorization filters. Also, something that's important is uh, age of the domain. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a second. So if you're kind of lazy and you don't want to uh, do a little work ahead of your campaign, you can just use expired domains that already have categorizations. So a domain that's existed for maybe one, five, or even 10, 20 years, uh, this resource, expired domains, keeps track of all that and uh, will aggregate this information. And you can, you can see there's some super useful search, search functionality. You can filter based on the TLD. You can uh, output this however you want to do it. And, so basically, this might not last forever, but if you're doing a quick campaign, you can buy a domain that's expired that already has a large amount of reputation based on age and content that they've posted, and use this for your campaign. So there's some more search functionality. And uh, also, uh, it'll give any Alexa ranking or also search similar web and give you statistics on that. So it's a really useful way to filter out uh, expired domains that you might be interested in. So this is, this is what it looks like whenever you're looking up what the categorization of your uh, potential phishing domain might be whenever you've purchased your domain, maybe you've thrown up fake content or you've purchased your expired domain and they're already categor categorized as something. You're gonna wanna go find out uh, what solution your target's using. Uh, often you can find that on LinkedIn. Just look up the security people and see what experience they have. Often we'll say, I'm experienced in implement implementing blue, blue code technology. So then target Symantec's blue code solution. And this is actually a phishing domain that I've used on several engagements. So I've blurred some of it out, but you can see this probably took an hour of effort less than that. And I recursively, uh, clone, recursively wget clone a site that's financial related, scrape out some stuff that's copyrighted, and three days later I'm categorized as financial services. 
And uh, one thing that I want to touch on really quick about um, categorization and specific categories is more than just uh, bypassing domain categorization prevention methods, if you get categorized as financial or medical, there's a really good chance that you will, that there's something called HDPS inspection, and often there's rules uh, that can be implemented that break HTTPS connections to do content inspection. And based on your categorization, often they will omit breaking that connection because the information's financial or medical related and that breaks a ton of laws most likely. So uh, if you are lucky enough to be categorized as financial or medical, there's a lot of benefits that come along with that as well. And just like I mentioned a second ago, we have some, uh, this is literally a screenshot from LinkedIn. Uh, hopefully you guys don't know who this is. But uh, you can see some super use, use, useful information. We see deployed Bit9 technology. So I know to look for stuff that Carbon Black does because they were acquired. Um, Cisco ISC. We see FireEye. So when I'm testing my payloads, I, if, if I have a sandbox or something that will run against FireEye, I'll automatically know to do that. And also, I see WebSense email and web security gateways. So I know immediately how I need to tailor when I deliver my payload. So getting into actually pur purchasing your domain, one of the oldest but still most popular is just uh, tricking the user with something that's often referred to as typo squatting. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to spend too much time explaining it, but you can see this tool called URL Crazy is just doing super simple things like character omission, uh, character repeat, character swap. And if you look at that list of domains on the right, from the original Atlanta GA.gov, like you really have to squint at it before you realize what character is missing, replaced, omitted. And uh, at first glance, when somebody gets an email from like your boss at that domain.gov or .org or whatever, you might not look twice at it. You might just be like, oh my god, my boss just emailed me. And I'm fired if I don't do this thing I need to do right now. So uh, typo squatting is still super popular, and there's a lot of awesome tools to do it. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about something called uh, puny coding, which is a solution for uh, internationalized domains. And when I say internationalized domains, basically all I mean is a domain that consists of a character that's outside the ASCII subset. Uh, so like A through Z. Uh, standard characters that you see every day. So if you have a domain that has like a Mandarin character or a Latin character or a Cyrillic character, uh, that would fall in the category of IDN or internationalized domain. And the way DNS works, you have to be able to represent that in just ASCII characters, simple A through Z. So their solution was something called puny coding. And you can see right here on the third bullet, I show um, a character in red, which is a Cyrillic I, I think it's Cyrillic. And uh, it's puny coded county counterpart. So the, the XN dash dash Bank of America B5B, that's the puny coded representation of the internationalized domain, which is on the left. And I put the regular Bank of America site right below that just to show how similar the puny coded and the regular uh, version look. So you can see here, like, you get creative with your characters. You can buy some pretty terrifying domains with uh, puny coding. Uh, so, puny coding isn't all just like black magic. There, this has been done for a while, and there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, protective measures already implemented that you might not know about. Uh, I have links here to both Chromium, which Chrome uses, and uh, Mozilla Firefox's algorithms to try to protect against this. But basically, those algorithms just consist of um, character combinations like. Uh, Chromium assumes if you're using a Latin character in a domain that also has regular English characters, you might be doing something suspicious. So basically what they're going to do, as you can see here in this GIF, when you type in the domain, it's going to run what I call, what most people call unraveling uh, to the full puny coded format. So there are some, some protections built in. Uh, a few male clients do the same thing, but not often. Like the Outlook regular client, uh, like the desktop client, I've noticed doesn't unravel a lot of domains, uh, but a lot of web-based clients do, so it's hit or miss, something you have to test prior to the campaign. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the infrastructure that you need to set up for a successful campaign uh, to make sure that your, um, 
you know, your mail is getting delivered and that if the phishing campaign is detected that it's not going to affect previous or future phishing campaigns. So when I'm setting up the campaigns, I like to follow, uh, you know, segregating the assets based on function. You don't want to have one server doing all your sending mail, hosting payloads, receiving callbacks. You want to segregate it based on asset to make sure that, you know, if a mail is detected by the blue team, that the rest of the campaign can go on. You can continue the campaign and you're not going to lose any access you've obtained from previous campaigns. Um, it also follows the idea of setting up a, a redirector between uh, what the t what the target is going to see in their on in their logs and your backend servers, so that you only have, you only need one backend server, and your redirectors can be spun up or spun down throughout the phishing campaign. So a couple of requirements for our infrastructure to make sure that we've got the best chance possible of getting our mail delivered. Uh, you know, we want our, our mail server to work as legitimate as possible. So we're going to need to implement uh, some protection or some, some mail configurations such as a sender policy framework, uh, DKIM, DMARC to, to make our mail server look legitimate. Uh, you know, we're going to need to set some reverse DNS records. Uh, we're going to need to set, uh, we're going to need to make sure our, the domain we're sending the mail from and the IP address of the mail server is in good standing, not on any blacklists. And of course, we also want to make sure that all our data to and from these servers is encrypted. Uh, we don't want to make sure that the servers are uh, you know, locked down with a firewall to make sure that no one can uh, you know, inspect, our, inspect our servers and, and get us in trouble. So the backend phishing server uh, is usually uh, going to run some kind of framework like uh, I use GoFish, uh, you know, it's phishing frenzy, yes, social engineering toolkit that people can use. I just prefer GoFish. Uh, the server is not supposed to be visible to the defender, so there's they're not ever going to see this uh, this server. It's going to be static throughout the campaign. Uh, we'll be redirecting all our mail through relays to mask the origin of this server. Uh, it's, uh, I use that script right there to set up, do a lot of the heavy lifting. It'll install uh, the Postfix and Dovecot services. It'll install GoFish. Uh, it gives you the RoundCube and iRed admin uh, web interfaces for managing the mail server and sending mail. It just makes the whole process really easy because if you've ever configured a mail server, it's not fun. Uh, so then we're going to be sending the mail from the back end to this uh, SMTP redirector. Uh, and it's really just an SMTP relay. Uh, it needs to you need to make sure that you're stripping uh, certain headers from the messages that could indicate the the, the location of the backend server. So the X originating IP, the X mail or the mine version are all uh, you know tells of where our backend server could be. Um, your, your your reverse DNS records, your MX records, your A records for the campaign. You need to make sure they're all pointing to this redirector. You don't want them. You don't want to accidentally point it to the back end uh, phishing server. Um, and like I said, easy to spin up, easy to spin down. You send five messages with one redirector, you kill it. You spin up another five more messages, and they're not going to be able to easily correlate the two campaigns just based on where the mail came from. And I've also found that uh, when you're targeting uh, cloud mail providers like Office 365 or G Suite, uh, that they're uh, you know they're not. If you just spin up a server on AWS and start sending mail to people in Office 365, it's probably not going to make it through because you know, Office 365 is obviously receiving a lot of mail. So if they see mail coming from an IP address they've never seen before, they're going to assume it's spam. So I like to send it through uh, you know third-party relay like SendGrid or Mailgun. They let you send thousands of messages for free. You don't even have to pay. Uh, it provides really cool, like, it'll, it'll rewrite the links for you to like a send grid or a mail gun link, which you can track who actually clicks on the links. It'll track who opens the mail. And it's just, uh, I don't know, it makes it pretty easy for me. Um, yeah, the, the center policy framework and the DMARC records should all be, uh, you know, should all point to the third party relay, not your not your redirector because the mail is coming uh, you know, from the relay. And there's a couple uh, places you can test the legitimacy of your mail server to make sure that you configured everything properly. Uh, MX, MX Toolbox and Mail Tester are the two I go to to make sure that I didn't accidentally misconfigure anything that would indicate that our server is not authentic. 
And it can also be helpful sometimes to just send a test message to a non-existent address at the target. If you get a bounce back, you can sometimes tell uh, you know, if the message made it to a mailbox, if it was filtered upstream, or maybe uh, you know, sometimes even uh, protective technologies they have in place. So send, we have the infrastructure, we've got the domain, uh, now we need a payload to send. Uh, you know, capturing login credentials through clone pages is cool, it works a lot, but with wide implementations of multi-factor authentication, it's getting more and more difficult to turn a captured set of credentials into internal network access. So, you know, it can get you somewhere, uh, but usually we're going to want to send a payload to the target that's going to give us execution on their machine. And you can't just send, you know, resume.doc.exe, because if you send an executable through the mail, it's, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, and I, uh, yeah. These are the papers we're going to talk about. I'll talk about the office documents and we'll talk about uh, some of these other uh, special payloads that we've been experimenting with. Uh, I'm not really talking about like what we're going to be executing here. You know, this is kind of up to you. This is kind of up to, uh, you know, what, what kind of protective uh, measures are in place. Uh, you know, Metroka is the classic. Uh, I've had a lot of luck with, uh, you know, PowerShell Empire, which is a 100% PowerShell-based remote access tool. If you have a reason to suspect that uh, you know, execution of PowerShell is being blocked or heavily logged, uh, this Coatic uh, JScript remote access tool uh, is pretty cool. If you've got a lot of money, uh, you can go with Cobalt Strike. Uh, but the only important thing to note here is that whichever of these you choose, change the default configuration because security vendors are very good at seeing the default Empire launcher. They're very good at seeing you know, the default interpreter executable template. So make sure you, you, you change the configuration so all this other hard work you're doing does not go to waste. Uh, I've uh, had a lot of success with uh, pre-fish campaigns. So it's where I'm sending a payload. I'm not actually achieving code execution or remote access on the target, but I'm gathering a lot of information that will help me later in you know, more targeted attacks. So, if you, you know, set up the infrastructure with your redirectors that you can easily spin up and spin down, you could send 100 emails to the client. It's probably going to get flagged, blocked, but it doesn't matter because you've already gotten this information. You know, information such as the antivirus they're using, software that's installed, uh, gathering, you know, the domain or the username that you could use for some kind of payload encryption down the road would be helpful. Uh, testing different exfiltration methods, you know, if you can exfiltrate to uncategorized domains with your DNS, you know, that's all very helpful when you're planning the next phase of your attack. And it's worked pretty well for me when I use, uh, you, know, you can serve up these payloads with the Apache Mod rewrites to serve a random payload. So you can build, you know, five or six different payloads to gather certain information about these machines. And if you're sending 100 messages, you know, some of them are going to get through and you're going to get the information you need to really hone in your attack, make sure it, it works and it's not alerted on. So Office Macros is definitely my favorite and I've had the most success with it. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways of, ex of how you can actually execute arbitrary code with BBS how easy it is for defenders to see, you know, this, because WScript shell, just to open up random executables, is very suspicious. Anybody that's scanning the contents of macros at the middle gateway is going to see this and alert it. Um, uh, this is the second method of executing processes using WMI. I don't really want to go into too much detail about what this code is doing, but that's not important. Uh, the only thing I wanted to show you here is that uh, you see the contents of these strings. This is what this is what they're alerting on, like being able to spin up arbitrary processes with WMI is suspicious. So what I do, and this has worked really well for me, is I pull all that data out of the macro and I store it, you, know, you can store it in a document variable, you can store it in the body of the document, and you can pull it out and this will, this, you know, this achieves the same thing but without all those suspicious strings in the, you know, in the macro, they're in the body of the document, which obviously is not being scanned by the mail gateway. Um, PowerShell is very suspicious, uh, you know, even if you don't have the word PowerShell inside your macro in the body of the document, the fact that, you know, the office.exe is spawning PowerShell.exe is suspicious. 
So there's a lot of different, uh, you know, Microsoft binaries that could be on every system that will happily execute your code. Uh, these are just some of the more popular ones with MS Build, where you can actually write some .NET code, compile it, and run it all within the macro. Uh, the MSHTA, which I think Nick we talked about in a moment, and then you know, giving a uh, Windows scripting object uh, to the register 32 to execute. Um, very very sneaky. Uh, some of these, uh, you know, some of these binaries will actually go out and get the payload for you, so you don't have to write anything to disk. I've had mixed success with this uh, because I think that anytime a macro is being dynamically analyzed and it's making network connections, that's immediately suspicious. So I usually have better luck uh, you know, with some of these local methods where I will actually, you know, write that HTA or that file.sct to the file system. And then call it there because these are, I mean, these are, these are, this is XML. Like the file.sct is an XML file. AV doesn't know what, like, it's not going to find anything bad with, with XML. So I have no worries writing that to disk. Um, this, uh, this is probably my favorite method of executing code inside macros uh, because it's not actually calling wscript.shell, it's not calling any WMI, it's not calling PowerShell. Uh, it lets you uh, bootstrap arbitrary .NET code uh, in JScript or VBScript. Um, this is kind of what the macro is going to look like. As you can see, this down there, that's, a, that's the serialized .NET object. Up there is where it's being called. You're not seeing any of those suspicious strings that a lot of providers will alert on. Um, this is... Uh, yeah, so for this, like, you, you need to have some dot, uh, payload in .NET. So what I've done, uh, it's worked very well, is you, know, you just load up the PowerShell run space, and you can give it just base 64 PowerShell, and it will, do, it will do that fun stuff. It'll do that PowerShell, it'll give you access. Uh, there's some links there just to kind of walk, you know, walk you through the process of how you actually build these payloads, because it's a little more in depth than just you know, generating a mature printer launcher. You actually have to write a little bit of code for this. Um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of show you guys how to generate uh, you know, the scripting object using .NET to JScript. You've got to download it, you've got to compile it. But once you do, you can, have, you can generate VBScript, VBA, JScript. You can generate these scripting objects, which, which you can store in the body of the document. And then you can, uh, this is just kind of some proof of concept code for storing these strings inside text fields in the document. And uh, as you can see there, the uh, z.run is just concatting all those strings there that are used to execute this payload. And uh, this is, yeah, this, when I, when I have tested this and uploaded it to virus total, it's usually, it's usually undetected. Macro obfuscation can be helpful depending on the payload you're executing, but I found that often just the presence of, you know, obfuscation is alerting, and uh, even if the macro is benign, just the fact that it, you know, it looks like this uh, is, is going to be flagged by some providers and may not get through, but macro pack is what I usually use to, to, mac, to, uh, to pack and obfuscate the macro, and you're just going to have to test it and find something that works. Um, some additional protections that I like to put in place to make sure my payloads uh, remain undetected, that my servers, my, my control servers don't get found. Uh, I've had a lot of success with, with keying the payload. So you've got you know, your first stage of the launcher, which will, uh, you, you, know, you can key it environmentally, so on the, you know, the name of the Active Directory domain, the name of the current user, if you know that or you know, going out and getting a, a DNS key or an HTTP key, decrypting the payload that way that if you know, John Lambert at Microsoft gets a hold of your payload, he's not going to be able to tell where your backend control servers are and your campaign can continue without recompiling your malware. Uh, I like to put sandbox checks in there because again, you know, these, these documents that you're sending over to Office 365, they're going to be executed in a sandbox and it's it's pretty easy to know when you're executing the sandbox. Like, there's not a lot of computers running on one processor. Uh, you know, the, the people you're targeting usually have Microsoft Word installed, so even just checking for the presence of Microsoft Word uh, and then you know not continuing execution if you don't find it can really do a lot to protect your payload and make sure you don't have to you know keep recompiling 
every time. Um, and depending on how you send the document, whether it's an attachment or a link, I prefer sending it as a link because then you can kind of have, you have more control over who's getting the file, where they're getting it from, uh, you know, whether you're doing just strictly IP-based firewalls or if you want to go with you know, Apache's mod rewrite, you can actually, you know, you can look at the, the user agent, the IP address it's coming from, and you know, if it's an IP address that belongs to uh, Microsoft or Proofpoint, you're probably not going to want to give them the file that you're sending. So, yeah, if you look at that, uh, that link right there, that's uh, an example of my uh, Apache HT access file that it's got the IP addresses for the eight, eight, eight or nine uh, you know, mail security gateways, and if it's coming from that network, it just sends them to a but not in payload. Okay, so uh, David talked about some awesome stuff with payloads, and I'm going to talk about a couple more payload options we have as attackers, and also one other thing that I absolutely love: SMB egress testing. Why though? So uh, basically, first, just to touch on what David was talking about, um, the <coughs> you payload keying, you could call it, or uh, Apache mod rewrites. Uh, by itself, it's all pretty simple stuff, but it's so essential because David and I both. Uh, have had, I've, I've been pen testing for less than two years and I've had uh, payloads tweeted by guys at FireEye, by guys at Microsoft, and I'm like, I'm, I'm one person, I haven't been pen testing that long, like, why, why would they care about my payloads? But they do, and they will tweet it out to the whole world, so uh, the, the preventative measures are very, very important because uh, defenders are digging through your payloads. Uh, so, before we get into the next couple options we have, in terms of payloads, I'm going to talk about something uh, called SMB egress testing. It's super simple, uh, and I put a little GIF here just to show you. Uh, you can see on the left, I'm doing a TCP dump of my interface uh, just on port 445, which is SMB. It's on TCP port 445. So, what Windows Windows does this fantastic thing where if you go to a UNC path, which stands for Universal Naming Convention, it's like a file share location. Uh, you can do it in a browser. You can do it in your Explorer, like your, your file viewing window, uh, anywhere in Windows, it will try to resolve that UNC path to an SMB share. And this glorious thing it does along with that is attempt to authenticate automatically for you with the user you're currently authenticated as, whether or not you're on a domain, uh, local work group, whatever it is. Uh, all you can see here is that I'm going to that UNC path on the right in Chrome, and you're seeing it hit port 445 on my listening machine. but as we go to the next slide, you can see some super cool stuff we can do with this. There's limitless options. The first, the first thing we like to do on external testing is uh, if the client will allow it, we will just simply embed an image tag in an email. And it's just as simple as you see the little broken image there for uh, proof of concept purposes, but it's that line in the third bullet, image source, my UNC path, a GIF that doesn't exist. And I throw up, uh, there, there's a ton of uh, SMB capture services. Uh, uh, we have one in Metasploit, their responder does it, tons of services do it. And basically all it does is listen for this SMB authentication. And if you guys allow SMB to egress from your internal network, which you shouldn't, but tons of people do, uh, then you just start grabbing hashes. And even better on internal networks, if you start man in the middling, it's almost always gonna be allowed because you need that traffic internally. But I see it often on externals as well. When I'm testing it, just a client's external network, I'll embed an image tag, and the first 10 minutes of the assessment, I have domain hashes in net and TLM format. So you can do that in emails. You can also embed it in the landing page of your phishing campaign. Same effect, image tag, whatever, have it resolved to you in CPath, start grabbing hashes. Something that's also really interesting, and I think would apply to more uh, like red team stuff, is uh, doing this with documents. So within the last year or two, there's been something called template ejection. And basically all that is, is you take all the office documents you guys know about, Excel, Word, uh, Publisher, whatever it is, they all have uh, templates that can be applied, and you can just have the template be located in a UNC path. And Microsoft does that awesome thing and gives you all the hashes. So, that's template ejection, but recently, uh, if you guys have heard of Checkpoint before, they had an awesome disclosure last week, had to give them a shout out for it. 
uh, where you can do the same thing in PDF documents. And literally just about every PDF viewer is vulnerable to this. Well, it's really Windows that has the vulnerability, but the PDF viewers allow it. So uh, same thing, simple PDF. That's nothing really malicious is going on. It's just attempting to reach a file, like a hypothetical file share and giving me the hashes in the process. Okay, so we're gonna talk about just a couple more options in terms of payloads. One that's really cool uh, called HTML applications, HTA, HTA for short. And basically all this is is HTML that can execute on your local workstation interpreted by Windows script host, but it doesn't have any of the constraints that it would if it executed in the browser. So it's like imagine writing code to manipulate things on the operating system, but you can do it in HTML. That's HTA pretty much. And uh, the only difference between HTML and HTA is one header tag. Everything else is very, very similar. And it runs in the same process model as IE, Internet Explorer, but just without all the sandboxing and constraints that IE has. Just to give a little background on HTAs. Uh, and then, so I, in this quick two minute demo that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna chain HTAs and DDEs. So we talked about HTAs. Uh, to briefly explain what a DDE attack is, uh, it stands for Dynamic Data Exchange, and it's just a protocol on Windows that allows applications to communicate with each other. So if you want Word to do something and access information from an Excel document, you can use DDE to pull that information from Excel and interact with it in Word, vice versa. Uh, so targeting specific uh, Office products, Word, when this first happened, everyone uses Word. Word was hugely targeted, so Microsoft pushed a patch in December of 2017, and if your operating system's up to date, to exploit this, you're gonna to have to make a registry modification, which isn't ideal for us as attackers. We want it to just work when they get the documents. So uh, that registry modification can be made. Once you've gotten code execution, you can change that, use it to move laterally, whatever, but it's not ideal for an, an initial foothold. So moving on, Excel, it still does work. There's no registry restrictions, and you can still execute uh, DDE payloads uh, you see the string, it looks a little intimidating, but things probably look familiar. So the, all this is going to be is the contents of an Excel, the actual cell. So you literally just paste this in a cell and it's going to execute a ton of awesome code for us. You can see MS Excel. Um, this is a kind of a stealthy way to, uh, basically if you type run in Windows and type MS Excel, it's the alias to execute Microsoft Excel. Similarly to CMD for command prompt, all of that. But, Basically, we say MS Excel, but we're actually piping that to execute command prompt, which can be done a little more stealthy, but uh, this is just for proof of concept purposes. I use cert util. Uh, so basically, David was talking about something called LOL bins, uh, li living off the land, but it's just binaries that already exist on Windows all the time that we can use to do bad stuff for us, and it's a trusted Microsoft binary, so it's probably not gonna get caught. This is somewhat suspicious, but much less likely than like a macro downloading something from the internet. So cert util is this thing that exists on all windows and it can download files for us. So I do cert util, some flags to download some stuff and you can see HTTP attacker IP and the file that I'm downloading is just a base 64 encoded HTA. So it's a bunch of H H uh, HTML that's just been base 64 encoded. Then cert util can also decode that for us locally and then I just execute the HTA. Uh, and a quick note, Microsoft Publisher, there's an even cooler way to execute DDE if you have to. Uh, if they've implemented specific DDE restrictions, there's a way to bypass a lot of those restrictions by embedding an Excel document in a Publisher document, but that's probably unnecessary for this presentation, but it's a really cool thing to look into. So here's another short little GIF. I'm just showing you what, I've used this DD on engagements and it's been a very, very successful, a variation of this, but I mean, I, I've also seen this from blue teamers that have sent me like payloads that have actually been sent to companies for like actually trying to compromise them. Just put a picture and people that are, you know, people that are not security focused or technically inclined, they open an Excel document that's like, if they already have the inclination, like I really need to see this, this is really urgent. And there's a picture that matches the color and it says, hey, Microsoft Office, you need to enable content. They're probably gonna do it. But you can see the, the DE only exists of the string that I showed you previously that contents in Excel. So 
going forward, if I can play this quick little video. Okay, so we have our mail client here, and I receive an email. Uh, something that I want to focus on, kind of, kind of tying some of the things that we talked talk together previously, or talked about previously, you see uh, admin at Microsoft.com. The reason it's rendering like that is A, like I said, Outlook doesn't typically unravel puny coded domains, and B, and, and B, I have a puny coded domain for Microsoft. Uh, you can squint at it if you want, but you're probably not going to be able to tell which letter is puny-coded. And I'm also not going to tell you because I don't want to burn my domain, so... <laughs> uh, but I will tell you that the puny-coded character uh, renders exactly like the ASCII character, so there's actually no way to tell visibly which one's the puny-coded character. But, so we have this awesome domain, and uh, apparently we've been banned from all the things, and we're going to download an Excel file showing us why we've been banned from all the things. So it was just a link directly to the Excel document. We open that up, there's the image we saw earlier, and we're like, oh my gosh, we're banned, we have to open this. So we enable it. You click through to, and so here on the right, just to give a brief summary, uh, we didn't talk about like different C2 options or uh, ways to receive reverse shells, but basically I just have a, uh, I, I have a web server on the far left of the screen that's serving our malicious Excel document. And then on the right side of the black screen is my Empire listener. That's what's going to catch the reverse shell. So that's listening. We click through the warning because we really need to see this. And all that, some, something that makes this a little more believable is because we pipe that content from, uh, instead of using just the CMD alias, we're using MS Excel. It says, uh, Excel needs to execute something which doesn't look that suspicious. So we're like, yeah, that's fine, we need to see this. And you can see the, the wget that received the, or served up the uh, Excel document and also the reverse connection. So now we have code execution and we can interact uh, with our reverse shell. So that's uh, basically, and just to, just to uh, re-summarize what happened there, so we had we received the Excel document from our puny coded domain, which looks very legitimate. And don't, it, it wouldn't have to come from Microsoft. Before I start an assessment, I could buy one for uh, yourcompany.com or yourcompany.whatever. So it would look almost identical. Uh, if I know you're using the Outlook client, if we could figure out a recon, we would know it wouldn't unravel. And then we do it from your CEO at yourcompany.com and say, hey, you did this bad thing and you need to download this for some relevant reason. So we download the Excel document. Uh, when the code executes, it gets the base64 encoded uh, HTA. Cert util decodes that and then just executes it and we get a reverse shell. So Okay, so and just to, this, this is the last payload we're going to talk about, but uh, this one's pretty unique called click once. And uh, just to give a brief summary of what ClickOnce is, uh, it is something that deploys an application in an expedited fashion when you're using the IE or Edge browser. Uh, it's been implemented since .NET Framework 2.0, and uh, a quote from Microsoft themselves says, core principle is ease installation of Windows applications. So that sounds pretty awesome for us as attackers. Uh, the main focus is to update applications easily. That's it could be something you're interested in, but we typically disable it when we're disabling or when we're delivering payloads. Not something we're interested in. We just want to get our foothold. And then, uh, yeah, the poison in the next five manner. So I have a quick proof of concept just to show you guys what it looks like. So think like you have a C sharp project or like your your binary that's going to execute malicious code. This is like a manifest that would wrap that and deliver it very conveniently if they're using IE or Edge. Uh, this is what my web root would look like. My application that's going to execute is called totally trustworthy. <laughs> so when you when you actually are presented with the payload, this is a very unique prompt, uh, which might make it a little more believable. Also, uh, if you if you can invest in a code signing cert, it would make it incredibly believable. But 
we get this prompt, and basically it's just like, uh, it, you can see we're in IE, and you can reference some stuff that David already talked about about those cool Apache mod rewrites you can do. So like, if you go to it in Chrome or Firefox, you could give a little prompt that says, this is incompatible with uh, Firefox, please use IE to view this page. Then when they use IE, they're presented with this unique prompt for our click once application. And here's just to actually execute the binary, which is a little less suspicious than when you get the, like, downloaded some file to disk and now run it. And then you can see code execution of just this super simple uh, .NET code. So uh, that is a very brief summary of what uh, click once consists of. Uh, and the, like, like I mentioned with uh, what David talked about, uh, for HT access Apache mod rewrites, uh, this is a quick example of how you could do that redirect for um, forcing, like not allowing uh, the presentation of that click once application unless you're using a browser like IE or Edge that will be compatible with it. And that's all we got. Thank you guys for listening.